Jan Cross was a detective with the Spokane, Washington Police Department. She was currently working on a serial murder case that had been going on for about a year now. She was called in from her two days off because someone had come into the station with some information, and if Jan was honest, she was a little peeved that it had to happen on the only two days she'd taken off in months. So as she was walking into the station, she was still thinking about all the sleep she was missing when her partner walked up to her with beads of sweat building up on his forehead. He was Jack Olson, and they'd been partners since she'd graduated from the academy. He was ten years her senior, married, two kids, and putting on the Detective 30 they teased about. His belly was looking much like he was about six months pregnant these days. He'd worked plenty of serial murder cases. Washington was where God shook the earth and all the crazies landed. That's what Jan's dad used to tell her when he wouldn't let her walk home from school alone or jog anywhere but the gym. Hey, Jack, what's going on? She asked, her hand holding a flimsy paper cup as she waited for the coffee machine to pump out the sludge they had to drink around that place. After he hadn't answered, she looked up at him. He looked a little pale, too. You okay, ma'am? She asked. Jan, I've seen a lot. You know I've seen a lot, right? But this is the weirdest shit I've ever seen or heard. This guy is a lunatic, and God help me, I don't know how he's even standing. Jan, he is torn up. An ambulance is on the way. We'll have to go to the hospital to get any more info, if he even makes it that long. Jan was curious now as she stepped around Jack to walk over to the door where this person was being held for questioning. She stood towards the side and looked in to see what looked like a kid. A damn kid covered in blood. He wasn't wearing pants that she could see, not even shorts. His right leg looked like it had been bitten by a shark. There was a large flap of skin and muscle dangling precariously from his calf. His left arm was holding his right, and the gash from his elbow to wrist went straight to the bone. His face looked like chopped meat. He couldn't have weighed more than 115 pounds soaking wet. She stepped back. What the hell, Jack? Did the suspect hit this kid with a Mack truck? She asked. No, Jan, no. You don't get it. This kid says he's our man. Jan quickly turned around. What? That kid? That kid! Killed and mutilated 13 grown men and women? What happened? I is there a victim out there? Did a victim do this to him? Jan's brain was fully functioning now, and the photos from her crime scenes were flashing before her eyes. The dead bodies from this killer all had one thing in common. It looked like they'd been eaten like chicken legs. The flesh stripped off their bones, faces so mangled that their teeth had to be used for identification. This kid seemed to have similar injuries, obviously, but not nearly as bad. Holy Christmas! Someone took chunks out of this kid. She heard the ambulance come into the bay, and Jack walked her to the door of the room where the suspect was in. He had an EMT in there with him now, waiting for the ambulance. He tried to stand, but that wasn't going to happen. When the crew came in, they got him onto a stretcher. Hey, called out Jan. How long are you thinking? I need to get a hold of this kid. The driver looked down at him and back up at her. Then you should probably ride with. Jan turned to look at Jack and he nodded his head in a way to tell her that she should go and he'd follow. See you there then, she said, and she walked with the crew to the ambulance. The EMT looked at her and said, so you think this is the guy you've been looking for? I mean, how old is he, like 16 or something? Someone sure did tear him up good. If this is him, I hope whoever did it gets a damn medal. Jan wasn't really paying attention, though, as she stepped into the back of the ambulance and sat down next to the kid's head. Sam, another EMT, was sitting across from her, hooking up the oxygen and the IVs. Jack came running outside just before the door shut and yelled, Jan! His name is Thomas! Thomas turned his head towards Jan. One eye was completely missing. She could see the muscles in his cheek, his nose broken, his scalp torn. Thomas? She started. Yes, ma'am. He replied. Thomas, I need to get some information from you. 
Are you up to that? Sam looked at her. He's pretty pumped up with morphine, probably not feeling much right now, which is good. I can answer. He assured her. Okay, do you prefer Tom or Thomas? Thomas. Thomas, what's your last name? Whitman, he responded. How old are you? Jane continued. I'm 17. I'll be 18 in April. That's still seven months away, thought Jan. She could just not wrap her mind around this scrawny kid, being the violent killer with the power to tear the flesh off a person's body. April what? 18th. I was born in 1975. Let me skip some of the other stuff for now. You live with your parents? She figured there was time for his school or job or whatever later. She needed to get this information in case there was no later. Yes, and two sisters, he replied. Okay, now, Thomas, did you tell my partner that you wanted to confess to being the skin man killer? Yes, ma'am. Thomas, is there someone out there who's hurt right now? Who did this to you? Then, Thomas began to tell his tale to Jan, who would never forget this day for as long as she lived. This is the story that Thomas told while Jan listened intently and took notes, and it is based as closely to her notes as possible. The story began when Thomas was seven years old. He started to hear noises under his bed, and he told his parents. They bought a spray bottle, filled it with water, and told him that it was monster spray. They would spray his room every night, but the noises continued, and eventually his parents became irritated with him crying out for them. So he'd pull the covers up around his cheeks and listen to the scratching and growling coming from under his bed. This continued for a few years before he was finally brave enough one night to look under his bed and what he saw scared him so badly that he wet himself. He described this thing, this monster, as having claws as sharp as razors, his floorboards torn up from years of shredding the wood. His head was large, with a mouthful of shiny, needle-sharp teeth that protruded out from its head, its eyes at once as black as the dead of night with flecks of red as bright as fire, and it whispered to him, Finally... Finally, you've come to me. Thomas was too frightened to put his body back into bed as the creature kept his eye contact with him and continued to speak while spittle dripped from its mouth and a rank rush of air covered Thomas's face like thip, thick soup. Bring it what it must eat, it growled. Bring it its flesh or its will kills you and yours family. Thomas jumped back into bed and pulled the covers up, and his bed began to rattle. You've seen it now, kid. Now it owns you. Go now, and bring it its flesh. Thomas jumped from his bed and ran to the kitchen where his mother had a chicken in the freezer. He grabbed it, ran upstairs, and threw it like a bowling ball underneath his bed, and he jumped in bed again. Then he heard the gnawing the smacking of its lips, and it growled. Yous will bring its fresh flesh every night, or it will kill your family. From then on, it demanded more, until eventually Thomas was out at night catching cats, dogs, the occasional bird. The monster began to demand two cats, two dogs, three, four, until it said that those were no longer enough. And one night, as Thomas was walking home from his job in a coffee house, Thomas passed a homeless man and offered to bring him home for a shower and a meal. And the man came. Thomas took him to his room and asked him to grab a towel from under his bed. This time, Thomas could hear the being, barely able to control itself, tearing the flesh from the man until there was nothing but bone stripping the skeleton clean, leaving only the face having been gnawed at. From that night on, Thomas had to coerce people to come home with him, everyone from drunk college kids at a party to more of the homeless. 
He was always told that if he didn't, he and his family would be killed. On the last night, Thomas had refused to do it again. He could not live with himself. He knew that he would rather die than kill again. He knew that he could not trap another human being and then gather up its bones to go find a place to put them where they could be found, where someone could identify the person so that maybe they could have at least that dignity left. So he told the begging, the monster, no. And when he did, the being in what sounded exactly like the voice of Thomas began to call out as if in pain to the parents of Thomas so that he might kill them as he'd promised. Thomas had grabbed a butcher knife from the kitchen. He got down on his hands and knees and he began swinging the knife with his right hand as fast and as hard as he could. He felt the creature reach out and grab him, beginning to bite and to gnaw at him. And in one last attempt, Thomas plunged the knife into where he thought the beast's heart might be, and it slumped to the floor. Thomas heard his parents come home, so he crawled out of his window after locking his bedroom door and went straight to the police department where he confessed. When they arrived at the hospital, Thomas was taken into surgery, and Jan began to tell his story to Jack, who immediately called for a car to go to the residence of Thomas and his family. That kid is nuts, growled Jack. He probably killed his poor folks, that's what, trying to get off with an insanity plea, my guess, Jack continued. Then he left to meet the officers at Thomas's home. Jan stayed at the hospital, waiting for Thomas to come out of surgery. And when she got a call from Jack, he said, Jan, Jan, I need you to come here now. Jack, the doctor said that Thomas won't be out for another couple of hours. Shouldn't I stay? Jan, there's no need to stay. Get over here. When Jan walked in, she could see that Jack was perspiring even more. The house was roped off with crime scene tape. The photographer was there, the parents and the sister in the living room holding hands, the mother shaking badly. Jack, what's up? she asked, and that's when Jack explained to her that what she was about to see was like nothing he'd ever seen before, that he could not explain it, that, that, just take a look, Jan, and an officer escorted her into the second bedroom at the top of the stairs. It had baseball posters, trophies, and a basketball hoop, but when her eyes were drawn down, what she saw would forever haunt her dreams, a pool of blood deep gashes in the floor, the shredded jeans that Thomas must have been wearing earlier that day, one long, sharp, five-inch tooth lying on the floor, knocked out of the mouth of what appeared to be a hairy, alien-looking worm thing, a hideous monster. There was no name for what she was seeing. This being, this monster under the bed, Thomas was never arrested. In fact, the case was scrubbed from the department's files. No answers were ever given to the parents, children, or spouses of the victims. No answers ever will be. No answers ever can be.